So today's guest is one of the most instantly recognisable mountain bike riders on the planet. He started out as a slope star rider, competed at the very highest level before moving into filming projects with Red Bull and then ultimately creating one of the world's biggest biking YouTube channel. It is Matt Jones. Happy with that intro, Matt? That was fabulous. Can you follow me around and doing that everywhere I go? <laughs> with a, some Please. sort of, yeah, 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 with a fanfare. When I walk into a restaurant, you go in 20 seconds before and tell everyone that. <laughs> I love it. Matt, I mean, Rob gave you a intro. pretty good intro, but how would you describe yourself? Um, jack of all trades. I don't really know. I've done a lot of things. I started off, well, I'm a professional mountain bike rider. I do a lot of YouTube now. I wouldn't say I'm a YouTuber. That's no. just an extension of me riding my bike and wanting to show people how I do it, where I do it. Um, but I'm, I think I'm hard to categorize. So maybe that's what today's going to be about. Getting yeah, to let's, uh, let's, let's categorize Matt Jones. Let's that's put, it. I need a label. I need a label. Let's put you in a really small box. <laughs> Down Ella nowadays. So Matt, you well, you burst onto the scene in the UK while you were still in school when you were 18. It was 2013. Had that always been the dream to kind of um, be on the world stage in mountain biking, slope style? Yes and no. Um, I think I became a professional mountain biker by accident because it, when I was at school, I watched a lot of mountain bike movies like New World Disorder and things like that. And I loved it. Like I adored the idea of riding my bike on all these cool jumps, all these pro riders. But there was no evidence that it was a career. So I didn't really understand how you bridge that gap from riding in your local woods to suddenly being in the, in the mountain bike movies. And therefore, I didn't really go after it. But I loved riding the same jumps. I loved digging too. We should talk about that today. I'm obsessed with digging and building jumps like that's a form of art i think um and then got to the end of school was going to go to university and be a mechanical engineer which is a real career like my teachers reminded me of that a lot of times that that's a career mountain bike is about mountain biking isn't but then i did all right at some competitions got sponsors and then looked up and it somehow it was my job so now there's plenty of evidence isn't there for youngsters that sport action sports extreme sports there's the future for it but i think i was at that time that pivotal time where there wasn't any but got lucky yeah did you right grow up right then on mountain bikes matt like i mean i you know i come from downhill and i can see the sort of pathway at the downhill you ride bikes fast you end up racing downhill but like how on earth do you become one of the world's best slope style riders because it is so incredibly specialist like it's absolutely out there on its own for, for, for me it's like yeah. you know it's something so different yeah, it's a good question. 15 years ago, it was more obscure too, because yeah. no one had slope style compounds or like setups or airbags <laughs> to train for a slope style event. Um, I like dirt jumps has always been the thing though, like way back, whether it be BMX, mountain bikes, 24 yeah. inch, 26 inch, dirt jumps has been a thing. That's what I fell in love with. And that's your way my in, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah, really. my local trails, Woburn, has 20 second downhill runs. Um, which was fun. And somehow my brother got from that to racing World Cups. Yeah. My brother Jono. But they had really good dirt jumps and I loved building them as much as I like riding them. And I guess if you've combined the love of building jumps with like quite a relentless work ethic, you're going to build a environment to get good at doing tricks. That's naturally what happens, especially when the landings are made of sand and they're soft. I mean, that was brilliant. So I started doing tricks. I learned to do a backflip 360, things like that. And then... In that year off I spoke about, I went to some slope style competitions, which are just big dirt jumps. It was what I was doing, but way bigger, wooden features, not dirt features. But it was much the same, just way bigger and more airtime. But the mad thing was back then, for those few years, and it wasn't just me, all the riders that rode dirt jumps that were doing slope style comps had to learn how to ride slope style courses at slope style events. You can't practice them at home. There's downhill racers, they, pr they just practice, 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 going fast on a bike. Then they go to a different track and they just go fast on their bike. Yeah. We had to ride whale tails, flat drops, step downs, boner logs, wall rides. No one has that in the woods. So <laughs> no. the, mad thing, Matt, the mad thing was, yeah, go on, Elliot. Well, I was going to say, um, give us a little overview of like what those things are. Um, explain, explain what a slope style course is to the best of your ability. Right, okay, it's always under 60 seconds and it's a combination of features built on riding downhill to just allow riders to go as high as they can in the air, launch yourself in the air. 
to do tricks and you got to do creative tricks in different directions and combine a run together that gets a load of points so dirt jumps steep takeoff steep landing you're only going to be able to produce similar tricks so then slope style events said like okay let's start the riders up on a big scaffolding structure and they can ride off ride off the end of that like riding off a house then you land on a landing with all that speed you go around a berm then you can have a big step up that's going to be a different trick then let's put a wall ride in and see if anyone can trick off of that then a whale tail's like an in and out feature it's just about being creative and it allowed people to invent tricks and put runs together that became more and more interesting but we all had to learn how to ride those features in switzerland or america or yeah. germany when they've been one for you so that was quite fun like i remember my first time trying to 360 a flat drop was in canada and i had to do it like the day before finals whereas now i've got a slope style compound <clears throat> all the pros have got them you're learning all that stuff at home to take to comps but it was quite cool back then it was pioneering it yeah and i mean you like the young kids now you mentioned slope style compound a lot of the kids have airbags and foam pits yeah. and things too to learn on have you, have you, yeah. is that is that put the, made the rate of progression since your early days noticeably more these type nowadays you know the airbag yeah, invention unbelievable. you can short you can fast track so i guess it took 10 years for tricks like a flat drop backflip like sam pilgrim did the first flat drop backflip double backflips all of those tricks to exist because to learn to double backflip you first have to learn to jump then backflip then get good enough at backflipping that yeah. you can do it on a massive jump a jump big enough for two rotations and then you've got to send that and if you land on your head you're out for six months and then you might get the chance to try again now you <laughs> could would be probably out forever <laughs> yeah true you could put you could cram all that into a week now you could send someone off an airbag even if they're not very good at biking and teach them how to backflip because you can land on your head now so that's made it easier to progress but a way harder landscape to become professional yeah, because, because there's more people at it. That's right. Yeah, it's more people safer. Can, yeah, mm. it's safer. There's less risk attached. Yeah, it's mad that I hadn't yeah. thought of that, right? Yeah, so the sport's grown then with, with the advent of these these aids. Yeah, and those aids aren't always private. Lots of bike parks have yeah. big airbags, foam pits. It's, I mean, some people are lucky to live close, some are unlucky, but it's out there. It's, it's feasible. You can um, you could definitely, at the age of 10 now, say, I want to be a slope style rider yeah. and get all the pieces of the puzzle in place to get there. Yeah. And yeah. Matt, one of the things that I've always wondered looking in from the outside is just how it's judged. I mean, I, I think we all <laughs> talk about judge sports and things like that. Like, could you explain kind of in a bit of detail what the judging process is, what the judges look for, and, and maybe what kind of rider you were? Okay. God, it's hard to answer, but I'm actually well up for answering it. So it's all based on what tricks you do. You're riding against yourself, not against anyone else. You're the only rider on course. So you need to produce a run that's easy on the eye, that's nice to watch, that makes you want to shout, stand up, like, oh, that was sick. You want to, like, please the crowd, really. It's quite, like, almost Roman-esque. It's ancient, isn't it? So <laughs> yeah. showing off. We all yeah. get to show off for a living. Um, but I think it's judged on the difficulty of your tricks. Now, the judges, even if they've never seen it before and you bring something new to the table... They'll say, he's the only one doing that. That's unbelievably hard. There's points for that. It's also how well you execute it. You have to land well. You have to land perfectly at the top of the landing, almost like you're not bending your legs. You can't slip your feet off the pedals. You, it has to look clean and effortless, which is difficult to do when you're doing something insanely hard. Um, you even get marked down for pedaling between features because pedaling is a sign of you've lost speed. You've messed up a little bit. You need to get that speed back because these courses are built generally so you can ride top to bottom without pedaling at all so effortless ease in an insane difficulty and amplitude you want to go higher than everyone else which is possible but i'd say the way it's judged now is they t you're actually only really marked down i feel like which is a good thing i feel like you start your run at 100 percent and they're looking for ways to knock you down whereas some sports would be like all about building you up. It's like adding points. Right. And I think that's actually quite a, an interesting way of judging because they're really, really critical on errors. It's all about perfection now. Yeah. Um, and that deters people <laughs> from trying unbelievable stuff. I did quite like the old, watching the movies years and years ago where people would just try obscene things that weren't even possible in a competition right. and they might and they might even get on the podium for it because they're rewarded for being mental yeah, yeah whereas yeah. now like you could do the run of your life which would have smashed everyone 
but if your feet both feet come off the pedals on the last jump you're not going to win right there, there's a sad there's a sad side to that but it's a it's an elite sport it's professional i can understand yeah, it's why. become more and more professional yeah. that's how yeah. it is Did when you... i when i was growing up the person i looked up to like the local british dirt jump riders called glenn co he um at the nec show in birmingham when i was really really young tried a double backflip on a jump, chain ring the landing, so didn't even make the gap, snapped his bike in half, like the forks and handlebars came clean off. He like rolled down the landing, stood up, arms up. He won. They gave him first place for that. Oh my God. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah. That's how much it's changed. Yeah. Is that, is that what you tried to do in your runs? Actually, answer that, and I would love to know um, if you remember your greatest run of all time, like one that really stands out to you in your career. Um, the best feeling was the first time I ever got down to the finish line at Crankworks Whistler, Red Bull Joyride, into that finish area um, with like 50,000 people on the hill. I think I only came eighth, but I've got a bit of a more complex story with the top slope style competitions. It actually took me forever. It took me three years to land a run hmm. and there's like three of them a year so i it took hmm. me almost 10 crankwork stops to actually land a run and get to the finish and I so made you would a just habit crash of, every time or crashed or blew up tires what? It so like, it literally took you three years of crankworks before you finished the run you were trying to do yeah and there was oh, ones why? where I'd, I'd on the last jump i often crashed on the last jump too which is more frustrating wow. it was all there's runs where i would have got on the podium i think um and then things went wrong or I crashed and I made a habit of hitting my head. I've had quite a lot of concussions. Okay. My best run, that was my best feeling run, <laughs> but the ones where I, I won, which is Swatch Rocket Air in Switzerland and another one in Colorado, they were the best because it just felt like coming together of everything, all the tricks I've been working on at home, all the ones I'd learned at competitions, all the ones I've been trying more recently. I could just, the, the course was perfect. The conditions are perfect. And it was like, bang, 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 <clears throat> ticking off things. That's such a rad feeling dropping in. And as soon as you've gone off the first drop and done a trick, like a flat drop backflip, that's out the way, done, box mm. tick. Then you're like bombing into the next jump, double backflip, landed that, sweet. It's, it's, it's a cool feeling working your way down a competition run. You can see why people want to stay doing it as long as they can. Why, why did you step away from it? And have you found, have you found anything now that, can, like the way you talk about it you, yeah, you sound like you yeah, love it you miss totally. do you miss that intensity of that like i could yeah. felt like i was on the bike as you were explaining it yeah. then yeah i've got the itch to do it again ah! <laughs> <laughs> here we go <laughs> yeah well, i've said that for a few years it's it's Happy such are. a it's such a cool tour and such a cool feeling and you get to ride with your best mates you're never against them like you're only ever doing the best you yeah. can you, there's no possible way that someone can hinder your performance like you're just riding against yourself so you can only ever hate yourself um come back i miss it we I, want to see it. If i miss it i definitely miss it but i chose i mean i had a streak of bad luck i never won a crank works and that's okay it was my goal to podium at one the concussions was a, a nuisance like that's definitely more and more evidence now that you should try and avoid whacking your head as much as you can i seemed pretty good at it but i as much as i looked up and I think it's because I looked up and mountain biking was my career by accident so I felt like a bit mm. of an imposter doing all these big crank work these slow style competitions I never even meant to get there and loved it for a few years but then I was became quite obsessed with all the other like parts of the industry and right. even like that's doing film projects so I had this amazing thing with Red Bull Red Bull sponsored me to be a slope style rider and then I got the chance how seven years ago to do that big film Frames of Mind and that unlocked so much creativity in my mind which i think's always been there back from when i used to dig jumps in the woods i got the chance to design and build a course and create tricks to do on those features that is actually who i am mm. and then i thought well, i don't get to do that at slope style competition because no. everyone rides the same course and it's not always you can't always be 100 percent creative and then i never looked back and then and that was it that's kind of so you you slipped away from slope style rather than it was a decision to walk away from it then really it was like you got into other things that ticked your boxes more yeah yeah it's true i never actually decided to retire oh. from it. it was never quite no i just yeah i guess again looked up and i wasn't doing it anymore i think maybe i i, I fell out of the points and needed to get back in but during that year just did filming started youtube i mean that's changed everything for me i spend so much time doing stuff like yeah youtube yeah i was gonna say you still ride you know a high level and obviously youtube is full of that your youtube is full of that but like 
Would you be realistically now? It's been a while mm. since you competed mm. at the top level of slope style. How would would you be able to get back there now? Would you be confident you could you could get back to that level? I guess because I guess you haven't got all those tricks in the bag at the moment. No, I could get all my tricks back, but then I'd have to learn a lot new, a lot of new ones. Yeah. Um, I'm. If I'm being really honest, I know for a fact I could get back into the top 14 in the world and that's who gets invited to Crankworks. I 100% believe I could be on that list. I don't think I could get on the podium. And if I could, if I, I'm i quite a relentless person and I work hard, yeah. but to, to do that, I'd have to put 100% into that category, into that box. And then again, I'd have to press pause and all the other things I've built, which is YouTube, all the, the fun projects I get to do with Red Bull, the gigs that you and I do, Rob, where we've done commentary and things like that would all... The clothing end. business. Things like right. that would probably yeah. all slide yeah, yeah. a little bit, mate, wouldn't they? And they're all reliant. Oh, they'd stop. Well, everything, yeah, because everything, really, like your YouTube now is the backbone of your career, isn't it? That's fair to say. Well, let's, I want to, let's get into the other things that you yeah. do because you do so many other things. I mean, you're, you started that YouTube channel seven years ago. It's got yep. over 750,000 subscribers and I mean, it's growing. Did you... I know you kind of said that you you slipped out of slope style, or to use your words, Rob. Um, was there a plan coming in? Did you? I know you said you are such a relentless person. Did you plan on having this incredibly popular YouTube channel when you first started? Well, I didn't know. I I got I rode with a guy called Harry Main quite a lot, who's a pro BMX rider, who was one of the first guys to really push YouTube in BMX and mountain biking. And I always said to him, I'd love to do YouTube, but I would, wouldn't know what to talk about. I mean, <laughs> I just I just ride my bike. I, he, and he came to my compound, my slopestyle compound, where I had an airbag, slopestyle jumps. And I was t saying this to him. And he said, what? He was like, what are you talking about? You wouldn't know what to talk about. He's like, this isn't a slopestyle compound. This is a film set. He's like, you, own, <laughs> you own a studio. Right. You have a filming studio. You can do whatever you want here. And, wow. I, and then it, it reframed the whole thing. And I thought, oh, it's not about always just taking people riding with you it, it's so much more to that it's mm. storytelling and i could be anything you want yeah because i like being creative and building jumps and a lot of my youtube videos are building jumps building features riding perfect for me i i'm so lucky i absolutely love it it's such a cool platform to express yourself and do things you love and if you can inspire people off the back of that then even better if you can make it work like you do then to me it feels like it would be absolute freedom. You're not tied to anything except your YouTube, which mm. is what you're fully in control of. And that must be pretty liberating. You know what I mean? There's no one on the end of the phone telling you to go here, there or anywhere else. You are totally in charge of your your mountain bike career now. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I definitely steer the ship and a lot's changed. I mean, everything else now, all my brand deals, sponsorship stuff, um, all the opportunities that I find along the way, I think a satellite to the YouTube BMX yeah. center. I think that is where that's my platform that I can offer to the to the world, to the audience, and to brands that want to support me. And that's absolutely central to that whole thing. And everything else orbits that. So it's pretty cool. And interestingly, I got going with it quite early on when all the other mountain bikers were like super against it. They were yeah, trying right. to make life I hard. I remember they were, that. Yeah, 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 I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was really low status. Yeah, people like Bernard, Brendog. I remember filming <laughs> videos down in Surrey and they were shouting stuff in the background to <laughs> make it difficult difficult to film to edit. They're like, YouTube's rubbish. What are you playing at? Two, two years later, they're queuing up with their GoPros. <laughs> yeah, it's changed a bit so. now. Yeah, and I've got more subscribers than I'm saying it's a boat. <laughs> Matt, I, um, I want to... You have a very unique perspective, and I think you're one of the more deliberate um, people in in the cycling world. So I kind of want to dig into a little bit of how you think about content creators, and and you mentioned the business aspect of it. Um, give me an, I guess, give me an overview of what it's like to be a content creator. Let's let's start there. Would you call yourself that? It's part, definitely a big part of what I do. Yeah. Um, what's it like? It's so unbelievably wide open sometimes it's like so like so confusing like imagine someone said to you tomorrow you need to wake up and go and make a video a video and it can be whatever you want just make sure it's good yeah That's such a such a difficultly right. such a tricky thing when it's so broad and open right. to actually come up with an idea in that space usually someone 
if you work for a company or do anything you're working with inside parameters aren't you yeah you know I'd no, like there's you to nothing. design, That's right. design you an extension for my house or can you build a part to fit this airplane mm. and you're just being told just do something do Get something good do something <laughs> do something good so that's interesting so the the whole coming up with ideas is it's step a, one isn't it if you and can't it's a do big that, pressure really because you do what two or three youtubes a week i mean yeah like that requires i mean i've played at it not in your level but it requires it's it's hard it's really difficult to think of i found to do things to yeah, you know yeah. to keep that bubble rolling like yeah it is but i've i'm lucky that i love building jumps yeah I've, fallen, I've always fallen in love with building jumps and that's if you get rent some land and start digging there you've got 25 videos yeah that's see, right see so that that's where i've survived the test of time i think and not burnt out and not dried up with content ideas as a content creator as you say Elliot is, is investing in series really I've done mm. a lot of series which well can... I was going to ask you because there was something I did want to ask you don't have to answer this yeah but your backyard build you did in the COVID lockdown you know all the jumps down the garden there there was a lot of rumours about that from all the other mountain bikers who'd probably poo-pooed YouTube but people said you made literally millions of pounds out <laughs> of people YouTubers watching your videos during the COVID lockdown era because it did blow up that series but is that is that was there like you don't have to ask me was there millions of pounds involved because we're talking big no. numbers weren't we no I wish I, I wish I could sit here <laughs> and go like yeah do and then like lift up with three Rolexes on but, um, yeah, I've got a McLaren <laughs> Yeah, true. But um, that that was a it's, well, it wasn't from digging up my garden then, that's for sure. Um, no, I, lockdown for me was insane. I just like had a garden, and I decided I was going to build two bump bumps and a takeoff, and filmed it, and it got more views than I'd had in the last two years. And it I, blew I realized up. everyone was sat at home, yeah. probably wanting to do the same thing. And I was so lucky that I could legitimately do that at home, and I, I dug every single day for a hundred days with a shovel it was genius mate actually wow. it was a genius yeah. move you did there with ben who films all my videos with business partners living with me we just didn't let up we didn't stop because it was the like the opportunity a lifetime yeah so i did get like quarter of a million new subscribers during that time did you which wow. which is massive isn't it and i've yeah. retained a lot of that audience because they fell in love with that style of content which i still do so that's probably you know growing and growing and growing and I've earned money from that but I, I did probably make a hundred grand from digging up the garden <laughs> <laughs> yeah. most people are paying that's the line that. we were looking yeah, for I know, I know it's lame to talk about money but no yeah, it was interesting so many, though because it was such I, a big thing well I sometimes think it's like there's some responsibility to be honest isn't there because when I was 16 and I was trying to tell my parents this is a career and they right. said no it's not well I, there wasn't people on podcast saying you could make a hundred grand from digging up the garden so there we are yeah, I mean, and then how has that been, like the business side of it? Because one of the things that has happened in mountain biking and cycling, and I guess maybe in the world, is that brands have taken notice of saying, oh my God, there's this dude, Matt Jones, who has access to 750,000 people. Um, you know, you've started your own brand. Is, is the business side something that you enjoy? Like, how has that been to kind of learn that whole side of it? I actually love it. I'm, I'm really... <laughs> I, I think about that stuff. That's where a lot of my brain is all yeah. the time is opportunity. And I think, I don't know if it's my characteristic or from like my whole, from birth or if I've learned it, but I think a lot of people go through life letting opportunities pass them by because they're not looking for them. Mm. But I've always been really aware of trying to recognize where those opportunities lay, whether it's meeting somebody or getting in the room with a brand and then you hear them. I, I need to give examples. So, so like, for example, if I sat down with a meeting with a, with a sponsor and then I'm, I'm listening and they, they, I hear someone mention that they're struggling in a certain region, like the north of England, we're not selling many bikes. Like my brain jumps on that, leaps on it. And then when I come up with a project idea or a, a marketing campaign or something, I'm aware that we need to push that in that region. Right. So I'll say, right, I'm going to go and film a video up north. That's just an example of where I think I'm always looking for opportunities and things like that. And to grow businesses and try things out, like I'm, let's start a clothing company. I did it with Ben, who films all my YouTube stuff. So we're already together all the time. And he's really entrepreneurial in the way he thinks. And we said, let's make a clothing company. We did it right before lockdown. And then I got quarter million subscribers. 
Oh, that was luck, wasn't it? But then we said, that these, these, this audience are mountain bikers, let's make mountain bike jerseys, let's make trousers. Mm. So that's just one part of it, yeah. Go on, you guys speak, I'm just- No, 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 good I, stuff. I, the, the, the thing that I was gonna say is, um, where do you think that athletes, and especially young athletes, make the biggest mistake? Because Ooh, I think that the, exactly what you're saying is, is not how a lot of people really approach what they do as a career. It's probably their lens is facing the wrong way. They're probably looking out at what they need. Right. And whereas actually you need to recognize what companies need and position yourself as the solution to their problems, which are everyone wants to sell things. Everyone wants to tell their boss that they've just started working with someone that can help them sell things. And if you can, recognize that and be that person to solve their problems, you're gonna climb the ladder. But it helps to be good at something at the start. Like let's not overlook the fact that I did No, that's want, right. Want to be a pro mountain biker more than anything. And that is sent that's been integral to the whole thing. And I still am aware that I need to ride regularly and get better. But um, so that's like the catalyst that's allowed it all to happen. Well, that's what it? makes you creditable, isn't it? Yeah. Against perhaps yeah. Yeah. a lot of other, totally. what you might just call influencers and what have you out there. You know, you are, that's right. You were one of the best. You still are one of the best bike riders in the world. Yeah, cheers, dude. Yeah. But that's just- We saw that hardline like, Tasmania. <laughs> True I got that. down, didn't I? <laughs> Actually, yeah. no. It, it, joke, we were joking about how long it took you to get down. But, <laughs> But, no, we have been actually a little bit. But in all fairness, to see you ride that track, Matt Jones, slope style rider, turn up on a downhill bike at Red Bull Hardline Tasmania and to nail that, to do a race run. That that was probably the most impressive thing you've done that I've seen. I thought wow, that was geez. incredible. It's yeah, look at it. Look what you were it. You doing. It. Yeah. it was tough. That was tough. I found that course so difficult and like so hard on my body. How fast it was. You're normally 30 seconds and sort of 25 mile an hour. That was like wide open and 70, 80 foot gaps. You know, it was, yeah. it's, it's not really your, it is your ballpark, but it also isn't, isn't it? Well, it's the technical stuff, the roots and <clears throat> rock drops that I found so tricky. And then I come around a corner and see a rut that wasn't there two hours before and I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> you know? I yeah, I haven't faced one of those before. Do you go in that thing to try and avoid it? <laughs> you looked great. I was, we were laughing on the broadcast. So for everyone that, that didn't catch it, there we had um, Red Bull Hardline is, you know, it's this combination of downhill, some of the most technical downhill in the world with some of the biggest jumps in the world. Uh, and it's it's super physical. All of the World Cup riders were talking about that. Yeah. Um, for you, well, I one of the things I was looking at, we were talking on the broadcast, is um, you did some four cross racing back in the day. I caught that UK yeah. as a as a as a wee lad. Chick Sands. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about the different disciplines? If you were to kind of um, think about what makes a rider great, is it that they can race and and do tricks and you know be a slope style rider go to somewhere like rampage like well-rounded um because you're one of the only riders in the world that has competed at the level that you're at in so many different disciplines yeah i'm lucky yeah, um true. what makes a good rider i think they have to start off just riding in the woods and riding jumps on a crappy bike i think that's so important that what you can actually recognize the pro riders that kind of grew up that way they're you know like Cade edwards is just so phenomenally decent at everything <laughs> right. you just know you just know for a fact that he was just sessioning hard yeah. on a on a on a yeah, random when he bike was as a kid six like, years and old, he yeah. had as much fun hopping over tree stumps as he did trying to like ride up a brick wall you can just see it yeah it, for sure it reeks of that so I think it's the people that weren't shoehorned into a specific discipline straight away that have that that can ride anything, yeah. Because and that doesn't mean go. You need to fly to Utah to ride ridge lines, and you need to go to Scotland to ride steep, like rough rock tracks. It actually just means having fun in the woods, kicking in soft turns with your heel, and getting getting to grips with what a bike can actually do, a basic bike. Yeah, that's what I think. I don't yeah. know if that's what you asked, but I, no, that's yeah. what I think. No. Well, and also, you know, it's interesting to me as well because you're set up, it seems. You've got this YouTube channel rolling. You are who you are, but you still, like, turned up at Hardline. I know that Marin only 
just recently right made a downhill bike, so yeah. you've only recently had that opportunity. But like you actually came and competed at, at, at Red Bull Hardline, top to bottom. And I, I remember asking you, like, I was like, why on earth, Matt, are you doing this, really? <laughs> like, you don't need to, because that, again, is enormously risky. I I can't not, can I? If you get the <laughs> you chance, love it. So, you still love it. Yeah, I loved that. I loved putting myself out of my comfort zone. You did? Massively, yeah. And I loved the frustration of not thinking I could do a drop and then doing it riding away from it and being like yes yeah. done that one i am all right i'm as good as all those other guys that just did that drop right what's next what's next what's next and then suddenly you've done all the features and then you've got to go and link it together and do the whole race run and that was a bigger challenge again yeah and then i did that and i you... think it was overcoming the the mental challenge of thinking i can't do it amazing everyone should put themselves through that as, yeah. in, as many times in their life mm. as they can yeah there is no better feeling and doing something that you felt like was impossible. It's brilliant. Also, riding into a finish area again with a load of crowd right, was yeah, sick. Totally I haven't right. done that for five years. Yeah, That's a lot of people's about that. job now. That, that I, I really remember coming off the road gap on the race day and hearing a crowd and thinking, oh, I haven't, that is a noise that I haven't heard for Did so you? long. Yeah, and, it, and I had such savage arm pump, but it went away because I was like, <laughs> I'm there now. I can hear them. Let's get down there. So that was awesome. And I've had... I had a son who's just turned one a year ago, and it, I think it's cool that while he's been alive, I get I'm going to do some events. And yeah, very along, cool. So, yeah. so I can show him some pictures one day to say, "Look, I still had it when you were, <laughs> when you were alive, mate." Yeah. Yeah. So they're the reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, have you ever thought about doing Rampage? God, I've been there a few times to do some like stuff with Red Bull, just telling the world. How Got a bike it is. now. You could do weather all on slope style bikes yeah. now, anyway, yeah. Matt. So yeah. it's come back around your way, anyway. The bit that the bit that what makes me want to do rampage more than anything is that you get to build your own line. I love that. Well, That's... wait. Okay, so we've you've touched on this a couple of times, um, and I I grew up building building jumps. You know that was the thing that I love. I spend hours and hours every single day building dirt jumps, and I don't know if a lot of people really understand what you mean when you say I'm building jumps. So explain how much of an art it is explain you know how long it takes and what you're you know when you're younger you it's all shovel built so yeah give us an overview of what it means to actually build the stuff that you're riding um like hours and hours and hours of being in your own head being in the woods on your own that's what it takes so you how much dirt can you put on the end of a shovel like enough to fill your shoes yeah. but you've got to build a takeoff big enough to launch yourself 20 foot in the air to learn to backflip it's so much dirt i can't describe when you work with a shovel so i <laughs> when i was um at high like as a teenager so i was probably like 15 16 those couple of years I used to get the train to school in the morning and then get the train back and get off at the next stop where woven trails were walk up to the woods in my school uniform and then do 50 wheelbarrows up onto the landing I was building every, every day. five days a week. Yeah, after school. Wow. I did that for a while and I'd had a I drew a tally on the on the jump like five, ah. 10, 15, 20. So I'd just do that on my own and it would take weeks yeah. to build a to build a takeoff. Huh. And then at weekends was sick because I had loads of help. So many more people were up for it at weekends. Yeah. But I was there was a time where I was definitely just on my own, motivated to build jumps, to make landings bigger, to make them softer. So that's what it that's what building jumps is rampage they have a time limit and they have to do that you know it's really hard work they have to build it in hard conditions in the burning heat yeah um and yeah that's what makes red bull rampage special everyone watches the riding but my god the digging is a huge part of it well i think that the you touched on it too the the creativity of it and it and it is so much like art you like you had that um series design and conquer can you talk to me like how did you come up with this stuff? <laughs> like, you yeah. did, what was that one thing yeah. you did? The, like the backflip and then land on some like a log. logs and then front, like where does that stuff come from? Bike flip off one. Yeah, or like, I don't even know. I, yeah. don't, I don't even know what to well, call it. Well, I did a, a backflip took, and then as I came out on the backflip, took my feet off the pedals and they landed on two upright tree uh, logs with a gap in between. And then as my bike went out, I then forced it down and front flipped off them and made yeah. it into a drop. So it was all linked together. That, I mean, I'm not going to lie and say it didn't take like 350 attempts <laughs> to land it over weeks. 
and that was just like before I'd had tried it in a foam pit and airbag and everything. So it was how stressful like, was that? Like, like did it really take weeks and did it really take 350 goes? I mean, now like you got a film crew there. There's a lot of pressure yeah. on you. Someone's That's created this thing, for you, Rob. yeah, and you can get it's hurt at any moment really. doing that as well, right? I mean, it well, carries I, risk. I could only do. I felt like I could only do 20 to 30 a day because it was uh, my, made my legs fatigue so much. <laughs> wow. The force of like the top of a log going up through Good your heels grief, all the way man. up through your legs, coming down out from a backflip to then try and put, like compose yourself and stop the bike twisting in half a second to then throw it off. And then the number of times I landed on my back or my yeah. ass on the drop. But then when you get to the end of the day and it didn't happen, it's not like when you're sessioning as a kid in your local woods, you just go home, have tea and try again the next day. You got to like tell the whole film crew who have been there six days, like, oh, we'd probably need to extend this trip and make it seven. So you can't go home and see your families, but I will land it tomorrow. I promise I got wow. so close. And then the next day doesn't happen, you know? Yeah. And then you're looking at rebooking everything two weeks later wow. for the whole crew to come back. So I felt like I carried that stress and that pressure a lot, but it all just, those trick ideas just actually exist in my head. And then when I think of one that I think might work, I visualize doing it loads and then try and build a practice setup to recognize, is this possible? When I know it is, Red Bull come on board and we go and make it happen. It's, yeah. With something like that trick though, in your, you're saying you could do 30 a day. How do, do you, after each one, are you assessing how you just did it? And like, do you try and then correct it on the next one? Or do you just keep going till you get it? Is it like a muscle memory thing and it's going to take that amount of time? Like what's the what's sort of the process in your head to actually, like under all that pressure, make it happen? Or do you just keep going? You've got to make micro changes and things to work towards landing it. Because it's but so it's tech, you said it? about mm. muscle memory. When you've done something 300 times wrong, your muscle memory is actually telling your body how to keep doing it badly yeah. so you've got to make massive changes to get away from that habit because you could go another thousand times just doing it wrong and it's that's hard to realize that right when you're in it at. yeah all you're practicing is how to crash and that's gets <laughs> right. frustrating yeah. yeah so people say like if you if you're trying a trick and you start crashing at it just leave it because you're only going to get you're only going to get more used to right crashing. that's what you're learning yeah that's true yeah, as yeah, well yeah. right it's gnarly isn't it when you think about that yeah yeah do you have a, a favorite video that you've done? Actually, Frames of Mind, even though it's seven years old, that, yeah. was, that was epic. I just got to turn this forest into a mega riding environment and try a load of, try a load of mad stuff. You get so fed actually, up of all the knocks, Matt. You, you know, because like you say, you're still out shooting YouTube. You're still knocking yourself about. Do you get tired of being out all the time? Everything you do, you sort of hit the ground at, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true, isn't it? That's how it is. My ankles kill the whole time. <laughs> Do I, they? I, the only one that really, really bothers me is when I hit my head. I know. And like, yeah, yeah. I get a real like, oh, that was quite a big one. I can see stars. Like, damn. Yeah. Should I now is that it for the day? Mm. And you know, the answer is yes. But then, when you hit your head, you also you're not in loads of pain. It's not right. like you rolled your ankle. You, you can ride more. So yeah, that's always a bit of a quandary. But um, I don't know. It's <laughs> what did you ask? Am, am I tired of all the knocks? Not really. It's <laughs> Good. Yeah. That's all right. No. I mean, you, you talk about putting yourself out of your comfort zone. You've done, you're a really good presenter and commentator. You've done a lot more of that stuff kind of on the TV side. You've done some stunts. Do you enjoy that side of things? Yeah. Um, which you get, yeah, what a, what a life where you get to go to an event. I, I remember the first time I did a commentary gig. It was what it was with you, Rob, and I remember the bizarre feeling of getting on a going to an airport to go to a mountain bike event, a slope style event, without my bike. Just a pen. <laughs> I thought, well, is this, I thought well, this this is cool, but is, I'm also a bit worried. Is this is this what I'm doing now? Am I going to slope style events without a bike? Yeah, <laughs> weird feeling, so, eh? Yeah. yeah, and you'd have remembered it too, Rob, yeah, right? Yeah, and you, Elliot. Yeah. We all can sit here and say we've been to like the events that ordinarily we'd be riding, right, and we didn't even yeah. take a bike. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I've loved all the opportunities that have come from spiraling off from me, just loving biking. Um, yeah, we're in a, 
really I cool mean, spot, aren't we? you guys did uh, the Dakar Rally. How was that? I mean, totally outside of bikes and everything. Next year, apparently, we're doing it side by side. That's the rumor, Matt. <laughs> isn't it? Have you heard that rumor? That's the rumor I've heard. It's not even a rumor anymore. This is now an announcement. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I hear it with good merit that Red Bull would like us oh to race the Dakar God. Rally in a side by side. That, I think um, the yeah, I just signed this, and I think that's it done. There we go. <laughs> signed on the dotted map. It's coming yeah, your Rob, way. Rob and I got to go to Saudi Arabia, a country I don't imagine I'd have ever gone to, yeah. to watch like one of the most in- unbelievable off-road races ever ever created. And it was cool, wasn't it? We we're actually Whoa. living in a desert, moving hundreds of miles a day watching lunatics race over sat blind over sand dunes at 100 miles an hour and, <laughs> and then turn up to a bunch of lunatics that are their pit crew that basically don't sleep for three weeks and just like yeah and it's like the, it's just, just you'd be in your tent at three o'clock in the morning and people will just be outside chatting like it's midday right, like it, right, there is no crazy. clock there it's just mad yeah. you can't it was it's a, it was one of the maddest things i've ever witnessed definitely Me too. yeah it was insane so just to dip our toe into that for a week yeah is, it's not. It's actually a logistical masterclass. Mm. Yeah, all that can happen. The planning to make that event happen, and and the fact you yeah you, yeah you can't actually get your head around it until you really? honestly yeah you see the cars yeah. in the desert, but yeah. you know on the on the beautiful images you see everywhere. But what goes behind it is yeah. just it's absolutely yeah. absurd, insane. So we have been lucky, haven't we? Like yeah, we start. I mean, I'm a professional mountain biker, but that was still part of my job. Now is to go and spend some time in Saudi Arabia. Rob and I, a few years back, went to Africa and stayed with a Maasai tribe. Yeah. Rode, our, yeah. rode our bikes from their village down to a, like, down a trail. And, and what we, a night like, that was, Matt, eh? It was, yeah. <laughs> big, chief, big chief chief coming in our mud in the middle of the night. I mean, he was yeah. incredible, wasn't he? Huh? Yeah, wearing hard hat and a pair of waders. That's right, because <laughs> it was raining. Because there was a little bit of rain. Yeah, it was, it was so Oh cool. my God, it was wow. bad. Yeah, yeah we... that was for a Red Bull series called Wild Rides. Yeah. yeah. These are the things that, yeah, I never, I never, Thought it was going to end up where you get to do this sort of, and that right. all comes from well, biking, yeah, which is the maddest the, thing. And we were all kids that rode our bikes yeah. in the woods when we were, you know, that's how it is. That's how it all started. Hours yeah. and hours, though, obsessed. Really, I was, and I yeah. know you were, yeah. and I bet you were as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think yeah. like you can, it shows that so few people, even if they claim to have a plan, you don't have a plan, do you? Because mm. where did it? Where did any of us write down everywhere that before the age of? 30, I'd quite like to stay with a Maasai tribe and take my bike along. That's right. <laughs> you know? That's right. And when, the op- when the opportunity like reveals itself, it's like, fuck you, let's do that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like being on the Masters of Air? Yeah, the that old was... extra on the Spielberg yeah, series, eh, that Matt is Jones? Crazy. I know. I've not finished. Don't ruin it. I've not finished watching that yet. Oh, oh, it's yeah. good. Or did you, me, and Gem- you just... me and Gemma stopped watching it when I went to. New Zealand, but we're going to finish that. So I did. I got the chance to do some stuntman work, and uh, at the end, there's a huge pileup. So we spent at least seven days on a film set rehearsing. No. How? Yeah, all in full legit World War Two uniform, all hair done like what? a like a soldier back then. It was so cool. Um, and these bikes were genuinely built in the 30s and 40s. They're nearly, you know, they're 80, 90 year old bikes. Wow. They're not replicas. There was a whole team of mechanics just trying to keep these old relics running for us to crash into each other. Um, and it was cool. So cool. I got to be a stuntman. And then when we watched the second episode, I'm right there next to the main guy. Yeah. On TV. Yeah. All because all I was recognised to be appropriately good enough on a bike to have a massive over the bars. <laughs> I don't know if that's a... Yeah, I actually got paid to crash for once. Ah! Okay. Do you? Uh, did that give you any ideas? Well, what do you mean? Like for for, for your um, for your stuff, you know, you're just like, oh yeah, yeah little Spielberg bird trick, you know, coming to the YouTube channel, no stress. <laughs> no, I, I don't know what I could take from that. It's the, <laughs> the production, the, the the way they make those movies is unbelievable. There's we we um, there's like this steel girder that stuck out a bit of the wall, right? That we had to race underneath, and we weren't wearing helmets because no one had worn helmets back then. Um. And a few of us were worried that we might clip our head on it. So you tell like the art director that, oh, that we're worried about that steel girder. Then you come back the next day 
it's been removed and replaced with 100% like for like steel girder that's made of foam. You wow. wouldn't be able to notice the difference. No like, why? Oh, yeah, overnight they're like carving polystyrene and painting it. And you wouldn't, Wild. they do the same with brick walls. We, we said, as someone said, if you low side round that flat corner, someone's going to hit a brick wall and things and it would be bad and it will break the bike and the, the lead actor might get hurt. Come back the next day, it's now made of foam, but you it's, it looks identical. That's mad, that's isn't it? Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's actually insane. So we were doing that for seven, eight days, and it amounts to maybe a 20-second scene in a movie. <laughs> Pretty incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Resources yeah, on another. Budget, huh? Yeah, Matt, yeah, different again, isn't it? So, Matt, you've kind of feel like live it like crack the code because most of your work now is is from home you know you you have a family now mclaren <laughs> on the on the farm i mean what is the um, what has that been like i guess just having having your your son there being able to work from home if you would you would call it that i don't think it's uh, zoom calls every day but um yeah tell me about the farm the home life okay um it's it's epic. This whole plan to buy a farm and move to a farm was to build jumps and have more space to build jumps, just to continue that dream. And I've done that. I've built a set of trails. We built a skate park in a barn. I've built two pit bike tracks. It's like really going. I'm coming um, over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll Rob's be there on soon. the way. <laughs> so it keeps me really, really, really busy. And then I live with yeah my fiance, my son Cove. Four step kids. We've got three horses, three peacocks, chickens, a dog. No, why? What? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's every day is insane. You've got um, three horses. A peacock. What yeah. is a peacock? Like do? a bird with that big no, feather. No, I know what it is, oh. but like, what? What's the point? They're loud. What do you like? Why? I didn't want them. They, um, they, they came with the house. The bloke, <laughs> the bloke who sold me the house said, if we take these peacocks away, they'll try and find their way back to where they were born, which is here. Are they so yours for life? So I said, oh, mate, that's absolutely fine. Thank you so much. We'll definitely have the peacocks. Oh, and within wow. a week, within a week, we realised why he didn't want them. They are so loud. Are they really? Yeah, well, they're good guard animals, actually. Yeah. They, like, honk when anyone comes up the drive. So I don't know. Yeah. Are, they, are they vicious? Do they bite? Should I be scared of peacocks? No, you shouldn't. Yeah, they're fine. You I mean, could they, also... they actually fly, they're massive. They're like pterodactyls. They fly? Yeah. Peacocks don't yeah. fly. Oh, yeah, they like, block out the sun when they fly over the house. It's <laughs> What, like sort of a uh, Game of Thrones, like a dragon coming into land at King's it Landing? It's like that, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly like King's Landing. So, yeah, life's um, definitely got it's got crazy and wild, but I've got space to build things, and that's that was the whole point, yeah. So I and can't not... wait for the, the ground to dry out so I can keep building stuff. Yeah, because you're not someone who likes to relax, are you? Yeah. You like, yeah, that you, you yeah. want to wake up in the morning, you need a full day ahead of you, I think. I think that's how you like it. yeah. I moan about it sometimes. But I think, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. If someone said to me, "You're not doing anything tomorrow," I'd quite quickly find ways of filling a day. Yeah, we we must all be like that because otherwise you wouldn't stick stick with anything. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. Do you uh, do you want your son to follow your path as well? Uh, I mean, I'm not going to stop him, but <laughs> he could do he could do whatever. I just, yeah, hopefully he doesn't get into horses. They're a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> can you ride a horse? I can just about, yeah. But the that riding something that's got a mind of its own. Is, Boy, uh, they're lethal, mate. Yeah, yeah you, try, you want them to go left, they go right. You want them to stop and they want to run as fast as they physically can. Yeah. Like, I, I got on one in Ecuador. I hadn't been on one before <laughs> ever. And one, its mate trotted off in front. And then this one's like, just picks up speed. And I'm freaking out on the back of it. And mate, he's like, they're a pack animal. And I'm like, I don't care. It's like, it's completely out of control. It just trotted off up this hill. And like, I was passenger. I had no, it was, it was gnarly. I tell you, I wasn't It would have recognised your weakness. Yeah, well, right? yeah apparently. Yeah. Cool. Luckily, my feet could touch down each side of it. So it wasn't too well, it wasn't a horse. It was like a donkey <laughs> joking, or something. I always think that they're like um, motocross bikes with the mind of their own where the throttle can get stuck. Oh, they're dangerous things, in my yeah. opinion. I mean, not saying I don't like horses. They're a beautiful creature, yeah, but I don't want to be on the back of one. Do you I just know what I mean? I see them from afar. Mm. Yeah, pat one. Give yeah, it some yeah, grass with I, a perfectly yeah. flat hand and a carrot. They're a lot bigger than you. And you're not though. you're not holding anything solid. We're so used to holding a pair of bars. You're holding these like two flimsy little <laughs> strings. Yeah. What, what good's that? How can you support your weight with that? You can't. It doesn't make sense. If I could put a set of good handlebars on a horse, I think I'd be a good rider. 
Yeah, I agree you, with you. Something such, you could get a bit yeah, of leverage can you, on. Can you please do a YouTube video of a horse with handlebars? It's yeah, coming. Gemma keeps telling me it won't work, but I'm going to do some mods. <laughs> yeah, just 3D print some sort of neck thing. <laughs> Stick a set of handlebars on it. I think it'll work. Yeah. All uh, right, watch it. Give me three months. Uh, I love it. I'm just going to see a thumbnail of a horse head, Matt Jones, and then somebody like falling off. Probably. Like that. It'd be good. Oh, man. And I also want to touch on your brother, Jono. I mean, you guys yeah. grew up riding together i mean he was he raced the world cups and you know now he's he's in the corporate world he didn't escape but uh yeah what has that been like i mean he's still in the scene he he does some also some presenting and stuff like that i know john is like very well loved in the mountain bike world he's yeah he is seriously yeah, yeah. Guy. and it was probably not fair that i didn't mention him at the start of the podcast actually because i can't think of anything more integral to my interest in the sport from a young age and having a twin an identical twin brother that shared that interest yeah um someone who's the same age pretty much the same build same height riding the same bike i mean my mum and dad bought two identical bmx's for us one red one green so huh. oh, that's awesome. when, if you want to compete against someone and it be fair competition you don't get more even stevens than a twin do you so right. it was good it was a good way of staying competitive from a young age in a healthy way you know we just wanted to be better than each other and that was quite you know you quite quickly climb and climb and climb um you but never he fell out always much. what's that you never like me and my brother he raced he was really competitive and i've never spoke to him since <laughs> you know even though it was <laughs> like 20 laughed. years ago but you and laughed. you and john were pretty you stayed pretty close all the way through it you're, you're tight aren't you yeah, in the four cross days when we actually raced head to head, we were on the start gate together. We'd argue quite a lot, naturally. <laughs> but bizarrely, he's always been interested in going fast um, and racing downhill. Ultimately, that's where you end up. And I've liked doing tricks yeah. and jumping. Yeah. Whether we go, when we went skiing together once with the school, he just wanted to do straight line bombs, top to bottom. And I quite like dicking around in the woods trying to find little jumps. I think it's how our brains work differently. So we actually haven't, throughout our careers, haven't spent a great deal of time competing against each other. However, Red Bull Hardline this year in Wales. Oh, we'll be back it's on. Again, potentially. Oh, no way. Yeah. Who knows? Well, I want to race it. So does he, but... Jones. You're in. Let's You're in, it, yeah. Are we? You told me that... Yeah? Oh, yeah you told me that apparently Jono was riding. So you, yeah, you, you worded it so that you definitely got a ride and Jono got a ride. Well, you text me, you're interested in hardline. I said, I'll only do it if Jono's That's on the That's right. List. And then you said that, yeah, you said that someone said it's fine. So I was like, okay, then. we just got to get clarification. Yes. It's over. Well, you're the director of sport. All right, you're in. Yeah. <laughs> I folded up. I folded up. You and Jono. Oh, but we man. need it, don't we? We need this race. It's like the race within a race at hardline. Yeah. True. This is I mean, the one that everyone's me. actually interested in. I don't even know why we're, why we're hyping it up. He's going to put a minute into me. The battle of the century right here. Yeah, it is. It's like... um. Like, Red Bull have to assess whether or not they can afford the TV satellite time to put me on a track like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, man, Matt, this has been great. I feel like um, I'm sure you have, like, so many other projects going through your head. Like, what does the future look like for you? Um, st stick to my core and my roots of trying to push the limits of what I can do on my bike. And I'm... I think I've done a good job so far this year. Went to Dark Fest and rode some yeah. 90, 100 foot jumps. Then off to Tasmania and raced one of the hardest tracks in the world. Um, when the ground dries up here, I'm going to be digging flat out, building more jumps, training on my airbag. There's some tricks I want to learn. So that's that's my year ahead. And then keep trying to make cool mountain bike clothes with Hellfare. YouTube videos are central to everything. So the whole thing gets documented on that. And then... Um, and I'm also planning on building a, well, I've, we've started the process of building a, like a Xbox PlayStation mountain bike game. So No way. Wow. Yeah. Is this like add, Matt add Jones specific? Or? Uh, no, but I'm going to make sure it's like the best, best game it can be as a pro mountain bike. I'll make wow. Sure it plays, wow. plays like real so life. Cool. Yeah. So there we are. Lots of things going on. Never not busy. Yeah. Never not busy. It's just to say, I don't know. It's just an opportunity that I kind of, sense was there and went after it so now i'm doing it so that's cool yeah no good that's what you do though you create you know that's what you you, you you you've made your own 
you've created your own lifestyle you've made it happen and, and you know to do it to the level you have is it's incredible like not everyone tries not many get there yeah and i mean i think it's been it's good for us to have people like you in in the sport to like show what is possible like you said yeah. where you can be a YouTube, you can be on YouTube, you can create your own brand, you can yeah. you can start projects, you can be an entrepreneur. And I think that that's like, it's something that's really important, not just for young people to have, but also for the current professionals to have somebody to look up to. Yeah, I couldn't to. agree more. I think a few years ago, when I started to kind of break free from the, the standard route of just doing competitions and getting sponsors, and like I had this more business mentality, when it started to work, and I was making more money from it i felt a little bit embarrassed because yeah sure I, I don't know you kind of think like oh don't, maybe it is embarrassing isn't it just being like well i think slightly we, successful we grew up in competition and so i think yeah. that when you like it almost feels like the pinnacle a lot of the times is like okay i want to i win and that is like what you almost have this imposter syndrome or yeah. whatever when you do something yeah that's what i felt of, but I, now i think yeah. it's swung 180 and I feel a duty to kind of actually just be honest and talk about it and help motivate people to not miss out on those moments in life where you can for, find a fork in the road and go off and do something cool and new and innovative so yeah I'm glad we I'm actually glad we touched on it for sure awesome well get you boys need to come to the farm Rob you're back in the UK soon I'm sure I'm back a week in a week's bikes. time and I'm coming over Definitely, to yeah. ride the sand track. <laughs> and Elliot, Elliot, you come sometime this year and I'll show you what a peacock is. Oh, uh, That'll be great. I'll, I'll keep my distance. But, uh... <laughs> Are you sure they fly? Sure I, they fly? I don't, I don't think they do. Gonna... They, they, I promise they soar through the air. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Jones, this has been so cool. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Matt. Wicked. Nice one, boys. Legends.